So surprise of surprises, I'm here to talk about vampires. Pretty much my favorite subject all year round, but it also is a phase that comes and goes. And because I've talked about vampire movies, in fact I've done several lists that list my favorite vampire movies by decade, I'm not going to talk about vampire movies very much today, but I am going to talk about vampire TV shows and books that I've read and that I've seen. That does not mean by any means that this is a comprehensive list. Also, one of the reasons I don't talk about books over much is because when asked questions about books and trying to relate stuff I've read, I seem to forget everything I've ever read ever, which is why I don't regularly talk about books. But I'm going to try today and hopefully not fuck up. So I'm going to talk about TV shows briefly first. Um, one that's been recommended to me with some frequency is Being Human, and I haven't watched the UK or the Canadian versions of that, so just don't ask. Um, here's a few that I have seen. So Moonlight, which only ran one, two, one season in 2007 to 2008. Very cheesy. I don't love it. I get a kick out of it. I'm a, I think it could have benefited from a second season, but I'm also not too broken up about the fact that it was canceled because it's nothing what I, that I would call special and is reminiscent of other vampire detective shows because for some reason that's an entire trope is a do-goody vampire that's a detective. I don't know why. It's really funny, but I don't know why. Also, there is this super, super wonderful, incredibly funny, based off of the film of the same name, What We Do in the Shadows. I'm incredibly excited for season three. Uh, if you haven't watched the movie and if you haven't watched the show, please do that immediately. It's very funny and it's made by people that love vampires. You can tell because of all the humor involved. Uh, Kindred the Embraced, which is based off of Vampire the Masquerade, which I know very little about because RPGs of any kind are not my deal. Um, I watched this... Uh, semi-recently it's eight episodes I thought it was tremendously boring because it's about vampire mafias which in that case you might as well watch blood ties which is similar ish present pleasant uh, premise and is also not terribly good but that at least had a little bit more going for it um, there's also the 2012 version of Dracula with Jonathan Rhys Myers and it's not great but it was kind of interesting the the changes that they opted to make I, I didn't mind necessarily I thought it was kind of a fun idea even if it wasn't particularly good um, the style and everything was still kind of fun um, I appreciated it even if it was not of course very good and I'm gonna show books like tie-in novels for this one just because my friend is borrowing the DVDs for it but forever night is another one that I love. Um, this is a show that is incredibly cheesy. It is from Toronto. It is a vampire detective who is atoning for his sins. Um, and it's super cheesy, but it's also weirdly addictive and amazingly fascinating while you're actually watching it. It has three seasons and I love it very much. And the books, um, the books I had kind of mixed feelings on. Uh, this one took place in like, late 16th early 17th century and had the writing to match which was a little bit tiring to go through uh this one had like a weird dream sequence and this had like of course like a very old vampire by the name of radu come and mess some shit up i don't know if anybody else has seen subspecies but you should do that if you haven't and then of course my favorite show in the world which will get its own video so don't ask i've had this box set for 12 years and I have probably watched the show at least 10 times and have roped friends into watching it with me. Same with this one, which um, I like less, but has very particular elements that I do still enjoy. Um, I mostly love making fun of how stupid Angel is as a character. He's immensely funny because he's so incredibly stupid. But then again, so is Nick Knight from Forever Night. So, some books. Let's see if I can get this arranged because it's not like I script these things. Some random ones in no particular order. Uh, something I read last summer, the Southern, the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix. I've only read two of Grady Hendrix's books, but I love that his characters genuinely feel like people. In some ways, this is very slow. Not a lot happened through a, a large chunk of it. It does take place over the course of several years, but the actual horror elements in it are very subtle, insidious, and surprising when they do show up. Um, I know that his other book, My Best Friend's Exorcism, has been greenlit for a film adaptation. I'm very excited to see how that goes. Um, I highly recommend that, like I said. 
So this one, it's hard to count because um, if you can find a copy of this and you're willing to spend the money on it, you are a fool like me. So when I watch The Lost Boys, this film is incredibly gay. It's incredibly homoerotic and then the book is embarrassingly straight because uh, in the book it's everything that Michael does revolves around wanting to please a girl versus in the film where it seems like everything Michael does is wanting to one up and please David, which is an interesting difference. The only particular little detail in the book that wasn't in the film that I was ecstatic about was uh, Michael getting burned trying to take a shower even though the water was on cold, which gives this implication that the grandfather had put holy water in his well water because he lived in a vampire place. And I like that little tiny detail very much. Um, if you can find that book and you're willing to shell out the money for it, like I said, you're a fool. It's not cheap. Um, this one also got a film adaptation. Uh, it also has two loose sequels that are from many years later that I haven't read yet, but Hunger by Whitley Strieber. I have mixed feelings on the book, but overall it was pretty good and it makes the very pretentious Tony Scott film much easier to understand. Uh, that film is very, very art house. I love it to pieces. The David Bowie portrait I have tattooed on my arm is from that. And this makes you kind of understand what in the ever living hell is going on. Um, it has a lot of uh, scientific techno babble stuff that is vaguely, loosely, not exactly, but close enough accurate to follow. Uh, Miriam is a much more interesting character once you really understand exactly what she is. Um, so that's kind of fun. I have not read the Strain trilogy yet. I didn't even finish watching the show. I was watching it while it was airing and then I moved and then I didn't have effects anymore and I never finished it. And now I just haven't gotten around to it because that's just life. But I keep hearing that the Strain trilogy, I do have the other two books on a shelf, I just didn't bring them over, is very, very good. Um, I just brought this up so that people wouldn't ask. Um, Holly Black has been my favorite author since I was nine uh, and the lyrical type of way that she writes made me really adore this book and I've read it four times and um, it kind of has that weird urban punky aesthetic to her writing that I really appreciate and I do very much enjoy this book and it's a nice standalone novel. Uh, it's an expansion upon a short story that was in her collection, The Poison Eaters and other stories. You don't have to read that first but it does help. Uh, this is a bit of a controversial one for me because while I've read several Poppy Z. Bright's books, this was the one I started with. And on the one hand, I find their writing really interesting and lush and very goth culture friendly. On the other hand, I hate incest. I think it's disgusting and repulsive and I'm not a fan of it. So be warned, that is a thing that happens in this book. Um, if you're okay with abiding that in fiction, um, and understanding that part of the idea of it is that it's part of a taboo in this case. That's kind of the point. Um, then have at it, I guess. Otherwise, they've written a lot of other stuff that doesn't have that particular little problem. But this is the only one that features exclusively vampires. And it's, it's interesting. I, I read the whole book in a day the last time I read it. Um, like I said, very goth culture uh, catering, which I appreciate. Uh, Lord of the Dead, which is a semi-accurate biopic on Lord Byron, but what if he was a vampire? It's okay. Um, it's not a fantastic book. It's not a terrible book, but um, it, it, the information on Byron is accurate enough to amuse me. So, But then he's a vampire for some reason, which is just mostly funny. Uh, Dracula's Guest, a connoisseur's collection of Victorian vampire stories edited by Michael Sims. I very much recommend this one if you want to understand Dracula a little bit better. This is one of my favorite um, short story collections of vampires, of which I have over a dozen. I just didn't have the strength to bring all of them over. Because each story in here pertains a little bit to Dracula and they have a little introduction before each story explaining how and why. So uh, it kind of explains some of the random bits of terminology, some of the potential research and inspiration that Stoker would have used when he was crafting his famous book. Uh, I have intensely mixed feelings about Dracula. I'm pretty sure I've done at least one video about that so I'm not going to go into that today. Um, the Undead and Cold Kiss, uh, 
These were kind of interesting. They weren't phenomenal by any means. But I, I, I appreciated them. I like trashy, stupid little vampire books like this. Um, I came across these because I was in some store and this was $2. And I was like, I like that this is about vampires and it's $2 and I can throw this tiny book in my purse. And then I found it at the sequel. So then I found this one on eBay and read both of them. They're short. They're kind of amusing. They're not phenomenal. Um, Roxanne Longstreet, um, kind of, I appreciated her vampire mythology. It was solid. It's kind of basic, nothing special, but solid. Blood Alone, I just barely finished this one. I did not know how I feel about it. I, I really don't. Um, apparently, uh, the Ostra family is an entire series from this author, Elaine Bergstrom. Shattered Glass was the first one, but this is a prequel to that. I didn't even know that this was the second book of a series until I started reading it. Um, the actual vampire mythology in it, I could kind of take it or leave it. I figured I'd throw it in there, mostly because the cover art was pretty, which was the whole reason I bought it. Um, Night Thirst was a little trashy and a little weird. Um, I'd rather just read, I'd rather just watch the film Stakeland, um, which kind of deals with vampires as a parasitic zombie-like breed, um, except they almost destroyed Seattle. I don't know how I felt about this one. With this cover art, I expected like punk rock vampires, and I was disappointed because this one was mostly just super cheesy. But I read a lot of cheesy, stupid things. Okay, this one I actually very much recommend, and these little paperbacks are long since out of print, but they recently did get a reprinting. Very recently, I think like two years ago or something. Uh, Michael Talbot's The Delicate Dependency has the least stupid vampires I've ever come across, which it's a little bit pretentious, but the actual premise of vampires living for so long and then building their wealth of knowledge as a point of pride is kind of entertaining. Uh, it's a little bit dry, but it's very much a must read if you like vampires. Uh, I am not talking about the Vampire Chronicles today because I think I already did a video about that. Um, I have incredibly mixed feelings on Anne Rice's writing because it's, it's very purple prose. It's very overblown, very romance novel -y. I have read all of Vampire Chronicles except for the very last two, Blood Communion and Realms of Atlantis. And I went through all of, uh, the witches books too, which I hated um, because again, I'm repulsed by incest, how weird. So I'm not talking about the Vampire Chronicles today. I just barely finished these. Um, again, sometimes I just randomly buy things because vampires are in the title. And Kiss of the Vampire, uh, the actual premise I thought was a little bit more surprising and interesting. And the heroine of these books, she's a little bit unconventional in a way I appreciated a graduate student that gets turned into a vampire. Um, willingly because she'd been imprisoned with one and it was either turn into one or die and so they had their whole thing um, and then I ended up having a sequel which uh, went into another vampire's history that's like a thousand years old and I don't know anywhere near enough about Japanese history to ascertain whether or not it's accurate so they're kind of they're kind of interesting uh, Nancy Baker the writing in and of itself is solid and I appreciate that um, so that's definitely fun. Um, the last fiction book up here, this is actually three books. So this is Midnight Blue, the Sonia Blue collection, the um, Sunglasses After Dark, In the Blood, and Paint It Black. Uh, Sonia Blue as a vampire, a self, she has so much self-loathing, this kind of punky, um, self-loathing filled vampire that hunts her own kind because she was turned by accident and is a day walker and is filled with rage. Um, this is a splatter punk book, so it does have moments of very extravagant violence. Um, I didn't bring over Richard Lehman's The Traveling Vampire Show and The Stake, um, but I could talk about those. As I've come to learn, splatter punk isn't quite my thing because, weirdly enough, as much as I like horror movies, horror novels aren't quite my thing. I still have this weird persistent human hope that things will turn out alright in the end, and they don't in books. And so... I don't know. Plus, again, with the incest, I find it disgusting. Traveling Vampire Show made me very uncomfortable in a, in a way that I think was the author's goal. So that's unfortunate. If you want to know about vampires and their actual origins, like where the myth came from and everything, this breaks it down pretty well. Like the whole stake through the heart being to pin them to their grave bed. 
uh, digging up a like how vampires would only prey on their nearest relatives because the plague would sicken and kill people. So they would seem like they're wasting away after a loved one was killed. They'd, dig, they'd exhume the corpse and then they would see it as it would appear livid and consumed with blood, which was really a stage of decomposition and all these different things that kind of go into a lot of the mythology and understanding of how we view vampires. This is mostly very Western. And when I say Western, I mean from like Greek um, forward. This doesn't necessarily cover um, different Asian vampires. So this is kind of a fun one. Um, I do very much recommend that if you're interested in actual like where the vampire myths came from. Um, this is just, I do have just a handful of just standard encyclopedias that does not actually mean that I've read them, but they say vampire on the cover and I buy them because I'm a simple creature. Um, and like encyclopedias are just a good place to start. So this covers anything from like Sam Coleridge and his poems that may reference vampirism to actual vampiric literature. Uh, the Lure of the Vampire, I very much want to read this one and I haven't gotten to it yet because this is really the shit I like. I like academic texts that talk about vampires because I'm a feral fool. Um, gender fiction and fandom from Bram Stoker to Buffy. So this is something I'm dying to read and just haven't gotten to yet because academic dry language like that sometimes takes a different mindset. However, I did read this one last summer, Our Vampires Ourselves by Nina Arbach. Uh, and this does kind of break down our understanding of vampires in literature from the 19th century to the 20th century, because I think this book is from 94. Um, so this one's kind of interesting because it kind of covers how vampires were presented in fiction in the 19th century and they're more spectral creatures. Uh, it has a little bit more to do with like why they don't appear in mirrors and how we relate to them as like concepts of our fear of sex and death, which is rather obvious to people who care to study these things, but not necessarily obvious for the grand masses. Uh, it's a solid little book. And even though I don't disagree with her, I do find it a bummer that this author does not like The Lost Boys and greatly prefers Near Dark, which I'm not really that big of a fan of. Um, I understand her points and I do think that they're valid, but um, I find that to be a bummer that she disses on The Lost Boys so heartily. Um, this one was recommended to me and it is a hefty little thing. Uh, the Vampire Film from Nosferatu to True Blood, Alan's, Elaine Silver and James Ursini, fourth edition. This is just an entire encyclopedia about vampires on film. So, you know, it's a reference text. I have many reference texts. This one, dinky and silly though it may be, The Compendium of Vampires and Other Perilous Creatures is actually a pretty good little starter book for just vampires as a history and random vampire terminology from around the world, from the Bibi, Buta, Aswang, Bruxa, Chupacabra, Dane, Dierdu, Ampier, which I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of these because I'm bad at pronouncing English, let alone languages that aren't English, and I apologize. Um, but it just kind of, and then has short descriptors of the various types of vampires around the world. And some are a little uh, more direct to people's concepts of vampire, and some are a little bit vaguer some include some um, historical vampires so this is for a little book has a lot of information i think it was something i just sort of stumbled across in a barnes and noble when i was like 12. um again same with this one uh this is actually what that is a spin-off off of vampire the terrifying lost journal of dr cornelius van helsing it's cheesy when i was in middle school i was all about these really big books with all of their little maps and handwritten entries and little things because I saw the Dragonology book when I was 12 and never recovered. And so all books that are like this, I have such a soft spot for. And I don't read them anymore and they just sit there and I just look at them happy in their existence. Um, this was the last one in the pile. Um, the Vampire Hunter's Handbook, Raphael Van Helsing, because Van Helsing is now forever associated with Vampire Hunter's Thanks to Stoker. Uh, this one was interesting because I really like the illustrations. They're very dark. Uh, and they're very well done. Um, this is a kind of a heartier, more creepy book than some of the others of this usual type. And it definitely left an impression on me when I picked this up when I was like 12 or 13. I, I was just like, oh, this is amazing. But then again, this is the same age in which I found Underworld. And again, never quite recovered because I was like, oh, vampires are cool and incredibly fucked up. So, um, 
yeah, this one has some pretty interesting and slightly disturbing illustrations, depending on your sensibilities. So I could talk about vampires for another six hours and I'm going to stop um, because I get a little disjointed rambly and I stop making sense after a certain point. But anyway, these are just, it's just a little bit, it's just a small amount about vampires today. Hopefully some of this is amusing or informative to you. I can't guarantee I'm going to list any of this in the description because I didn't have a script and I'm going to forget what's in this video because I don't rewatch really my own videos. Anyway, till next time, Darklings.